Uh, thank, thank you so much, and uh, welcome, uh, Minister. Thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate uh, your presence, really. Uh, I just want to say a few words to introduce you to the audience. Uh, but the last comment, just about, uh, about the work that's going on. As Joyce mentioned about the faculty, all stakeholder groups, uh, we really want to know who you are, where you are, where you could be involved in this work. So please contact us via the website or direct to Angela Watkins, and we'll, we'll get you connected into the right areas of work. So please follow that up with us if you haven't already. Um, so I do want to introduce uh, Mark Drakeford, AM. Um, many of you will know him very well already, one or two may not. Some uh, remarks. Uh, he worked as a probation officer and a youth justice worker and a Bernardo's project leader in previous years in the Cardiff areas. He was then a lecturer at Swansea University and returned to Cardiff uh, in 2003 as professor of social policy. And he's written and published many books and journal articles. And from 2000 to 2010, he was uh, the cabinet's health and social policy advisor. Then he entered the National Assembly for the Cardiff West seat, taking over from Roger Morgan in 2011. And after a short period of, as chair of the Assembly's Health and Social Care Committee, he then became the Minister for Health and Social Care in 2013. His appointment was welcomed by the British Medical Association and the Royal College of Nursing. Now that may be an accolade that fills some politicians with dread. But what it does is it sets him apart from some of the previous incumbents of uh, this, this role. And the reason that this appointment was so much welcomed was that we recognize the deep understanding that he has of the challenges facing the service, public, patients, and providers alike. And this is widely recognized, and his appointment was strongly supported. I will talk a bit about some of his interests that are relevant to primary and emergency care in a moment, but also just to note one or two of the other achievements that uh, Mark has uh, steered through the Seneth recently. In 2013, the Human Transplantation Act uh, passed through the Seneth, which resulted in Wales becoming the first country in the UK to introduce presumed consent for organ donation and his work on smoking regulation, including recent public health proposals on e-cigarettes, and also minimum alcohol unit pricing proposals are key public health measures that he is championing. And it shows what we can do with a devolved health administration. Close at home, we know of Mark's flagship policy of uh, prudent health care, promoting effective value for money and patient-centered health care. Just heard about the, the grant work that we're about to get started. Um, to, to look at public and professional attitudes to prudent healthcare and how we can enhance those attitudes and get it implemented into practice. So those are particular issues for uh, primary and emergency care and primary and emergency care research. We know that uh, Mark has been a very enthusiastic advocate for the role of primary care in the overall healthcare system. And to, to that end, we need a strong academic base to inform policy and practice. Mark has been very supportive of these proposals for Prime Centre Wales to come through now to this, this situation. We also know from last week uh, that Mark uh, backed Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour leadership contest. So what we can conclude from that is that he backs winners. <laughs> so we're very grateful for your support all the way along the line and for being here today. Uh, we look forward to your thoughts about primary and emergency care research and prudent health care in particular. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, well, Adrian, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to have a chance to be here at this first uh, annual meeting. Um, you've got a fantastic programme. I was really uh, impressed when I looked uh, at it to see that uh, you managed to secure both the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Nursing Officer uh, in a single day, uh, as well as uh, some really leading contributors uh, from elsewhere. And I see that your uh, programme ends with Fiona Godley, um, who I think gave a really memorable uh, speech at our Prudent Healthcare Conference uh, just before the summer break. Uh, 
uh, something which uh, I've remembered uh, long since. And she will have some really useful things, I think, to say uh, to you about the linking of primary and emergency uh, medicine with the prudent healthcare uh, agenda. And I'm going to come on, and most of the time that I have this morning, I hope to concentrate on that theme myself. However, um, I think it would be remiss um, if I didn't begin uh, by at least referring to the grim context in which uh, the work that you are involved in and will be involved in over the next few years uh, will be taking place. Uh, there really has never been a more difficult time other than maybe the very foundation of the National Health Service and the welfare state. There really has never been a more difficult time to sustain the sorts of public services that we would like to see here uh, in Wales, given the real terms decline in budgets that we face right across the board uh, in our public uh, services. We are 40% of the way only through the cuts that have already been announced. 40%. We are not even at the floor of the difficulties that we already face, let alone what we will learn from the autumn statement that the Chancellor will make at the end of November this year. And those of you who follow these things closely uh, will see uh, the widely reported machinations uh, that are going on at the moment between the Department of Health and the Treasury to find ways out of uh, the commitment to provide an £8 billion uplift to the health service in England over the next few years. And the funding of health services in Wales, because of the Barnet formula, depends absolutely critically on the uplift that is provided to the English NHS. So I'm afraid uh, we read uh, authoritatively that the Treasury intends to exclude from the uh, promise of a real terms increase all the money that is spent on health research in England, that it intends to exclude from that promise all the money spent on medical education and training. And we already know from the £200 million cuts that have been uh, imposed on public health services in England in this financial year, that public health will also be a target for those reductions. So what we are faced with, it seems to me, is a sort of funny money uh, set of uh, manoeuvrings in which cuts will be made to things that we would regard as absolutely central uh, to health service expenditure, and then the products of those cuts fed artificially into appearing to sustain other parts uh, of the NHS. And that, that will provide a very, very difficult backcloth uh, for us here in Wales if those things actually uh, turn out to be true in November. Um, there's an old uh, progressive slogan which some people in the room uh, will have heard, uh, that the business of progressive government is to provide for today and prepare for tomorrow. Provide for today, prepare for tomorrow, but the danger is real when providing for today is so pressurised that we end up robbing our ability to prepare for the challenges that we know uh, are there uh, to come. And that's a pressure that's very much there um, as far as the research community is concerned, because so much of what goes on in research is about helping us to prepare for tomorrow, helping us to understand the challenges we face today and designing ways in which we can face those challenges as they predictably evolve over the years uh, ahead. Well, here in Wales, we've done our very best uh, to resist those pressures, uh, partly at least in this fourth assembly term, by bringing the agendas of health and wealth closer uh, together. And health research, health and social care research in Wales has benefited significantly from investment, not simply that we are able to make through the health and social services portfolio, but in investments that Edwina Hart uh, has made through the economy portfolio uh, as well. 
Um, through the Health and Social Services portfolio and through Healthcare Research uh, Wales, we are investing £28 million across the next three years in health and social care research infrastructure. And that, of course, includes the investment uh, in Prime. And our aim for that investment is that it will bring additional research funding into Wales, so it will attract other money alongside it, that it will create high-quality jobs, and, of course, that it produces the research evidence we need to make those decisions that will benefit patients and service users. And that's, in a way, the distinguishing uh, feature of the money that comes through the health and social services portfolio. Um, I do get asked, uh, I get asked by people why we spend money at all um, from the health uh, portfolio on uh, research in health and social care. Um, isn't that the uh, matter for the education uh, minister? I'm asking, you know, isn't that where the research effort should uh, come? And the answer we have to give in order to be persuasive is, is that we invest money in research in health and social services because we invest in research that makes a difference to the experience of our patients and to those who use our social services. Uh, and people in this room, I know, are very, very much part of shaping uh, that agenda for us here in Wales. And the Prime Centre, as you will have heard already, I'm sure, uh, builds on previous investments into the Wales School for Primary Care Research and the thematic research network for emergency and unscheduled and trauma care. Now, both of those uh, strands developed collaborative research networks, conducted some groundbreaking uh, research, and helped us to stimulate and underpin innovative service design and improvement. I'm going to offer just one example from each, and I'm going to return to uh, them both in what I have to say. So my example from the work that the Wales School for Primary Care Research uh, carried out was the development of their interactive booklet for children about respiratory tract infections. Uh, and there's good evidence to show uh, that the resource that they developed contributed to a two-thirds reduction in antibiotic use for children in those circumstances. Um, and in a wider way, you know, it's very important for us here uh, in Wales to be playing our part in the very necessary uh, effort to reduce the inappropriate uh, deployment of antibiotics as we try and find ways of addressing antimicrobial uh, resistance. And that piece of work done uh, in primary care research has been effective not just in Wales and not just in the United Kingdom, but has been used internationally uh, as well. Um, and at uh, Trust, the uh, thematic research and network in emergency uh, care, research into alternatives to ambulance dispatch and onward transportation has produced reduced emergency hospital attendances without in any way compromising patient experience or safety or quality of care. And that's research too has been used not simply here in Wales, it's been used more widely in the UK and in Australia uh, and Canada as well. <coughs> now what Prime does is to bring together primary and emergency care uh, research and from the first time that I saw uh, the proposal and John, John Wisson would have uh, talked me uh, through it, uh, I was immediately convinced uh, of the good sense of bringing those two agendas uh, together. You are all very well aware of the interdependency of primary and emergency care services, the way that what we do in one domain has such a direct impact on the other. And bringing those two agendas together, I hope, will allow us to approach the research we do and the ideas we develop in a way that looks across the whole of the healthcare uh, system. Now, I'm going to concentrate uh, for a short while on um, my main theme uh, of the morning, which is how does all of this fit in with uh, the prudent healthcare paradigm which we have been developing uh, here uh, in Wales. And the purpose of the paradigm, as Adrian uh, said to you, the reason why we are committed to try and work up this set of principles and then turn those principles into effective 
action in services is because we believe that if we could create a prudent health and social care system here in Wales, it provides us with a way of continuing to provide services, even in the very difficult days that I've just described, in a way that remains true to the founding principles uh, of the NHS, the principles that were discovered and hammered out first of all, of course, in Wales uh, as well. Now, I'm very grateful to the Bevan Commission for all the work it has done in helping us to try and conduct a debate about what prudent healthcare would mean, and then to try to codify some of that debate into a set of agreed principles. Um, and I'm this morning going to uh, refer briefly to just four of those principles, uh, which I believe uh, can be especially relevant to this audience and to this conference. They're relevant, but they are challenging uh, as well. Uh, I think they set challenges uh, for researchers, and I think they set challenges for people who then try to translate that research into practical uh, action. I'm going to begin with the, the most basic of all the prudent healthcare principles, uh, the one which, when you say it in front of entirely lay uh, audiences, uh, people are puzzled uh, by it when I say that the first principle of a prudent system should be that it should do no harm. Uh, and the reason that lay audiences uh, are puzzled when you say that to them is uh, that they continue to believe very often uh, that that principle is already uh, fully operational in the way that our services uh, are uh, delivered. And yet we will all know that very many things that go on every single day in healthcare services in Wales and in other places uh, too, uh, either do no good in the lives uh, of the people for whom those services uh, are provided or actually do them harm. And we have very uh, direct examples of that here uh, in Wales. And of course, the two are connected. Uh, because if you do something uh, to someone that does them no good, it may well, as a result, end up doing them harm as well. So research in Cardiff uh, university that tells us that over a 20-year period, one in seven antibiotic prescriptions uh, delivered by general practice in Wales did no good in the lives of the people to whom those prescriptions uh, were issued becomes a source of harm when we face resistance to the effectiveness of antibiotics later in the uh, lives of those individuals and in the population uh, as a whole. So. Providing best evidence, making sure that, through research effort, we have a better idea of those things which are not effective, no longer thought to be effective, or actually should be avoided because they do harm in people's lives, is a very important strand in the work that Prime will be uh, carrying out. Now, I'm always told uh, that clinicians uh, are scientists uh, and empiricists and that hard evidence is what they respond to best. Um, and that should mean that there is a very good platform uh, there for deploying exactly the sort of uh, aligned to primary health care uh, research that I've just uh, talked about. But I'm afraid that experience actually teaches us that while a receptivity to best evidence may be a good platform, it is not sufficient simply uh, in itself. Evidence does not simply speak for itself in that uh, way. Because if it did, then the well over 600 pieces of advice uh, that NICE has provided to clinicians on procedures that ought not to be undertaken would have had more purchase. And we would not see those procedures, as we do, being carried out every single day in the Welsh uh, NHS. There will be a close alignment, I believe, between the work that will happen through Prime and the Choosing Wisely Wales initiative that the Royal Colleges are taking forward here in Wales, because that is professional to professional advice, using research evidence that has in other parts of the world, in 
Canada, for example, in the Netherlands, been shown to be more effective in communicating to clinicians ways of doing things that mean that that first prudent healthcare principle of avoiding harm actually can be uh, effective in the Welsh NHS. And it's an absolutely vital principle, not simply because it would stop things that ought not to happen in the lives of individuals, but if we could manage to do less of those things that don't do any good, we would free up the resources, not just the money, but the time, the energy, all of those other things, to do more of the things that actually do make a substantial difference. Um, all of that, I think, is closely aligned with uh, a second prudent healthcare principle, which is the principle of minimum necessary intervention. We've somehow persuaded uh, ourselves, and we've certainly persuaded the public, uh, that the measure of success in public services is volume. But if we're doing more of something, we must be doing better. Um, if you uh, if a patient uh, in Wales wants to tell you uh, something really positive about their experience, uh, what they come up and they say to me uh, regularly is, is they say to me, oh, they're doing everything they can for me. In th that sense that if something more is happening, that that must be better. And actually we know that once you stand back from that proposition, that simply uh, isn't true at all. And it produces the paradox the paradox of the Welsh uh, NHS, certainly, which is a system characterised at one and the same time by both under and over treatment. Uh, under treatment in the persistence of health inequalities, parts of our population who do not come forward uh, for treatment early enough in the process uh, of a disease or a condition, and therefore we're unable to do the things that we would like to have been able to do uh, for them. We persistently have pockets of real health inequality. And at the same time, we have parts of our system, I believe, which are caught up um, in the tyranny uh, of escalation. Uh, that sense that happens in health uh, services of always people passing people further and further up the hierarchy of professional uh, interventions, an escalator uh, of interventions. Uh, now, when Fiona uh, Godley is uh, with you this afternoon, I uh, hope that she will talk to you about the very uh, uh, interesting and, I hope, very effective BMJ Too Much Medicine uh, campaign with a really remarkable uh, conference earlier uh, this month in Washington, looking at the way in which we can recapture a sense uh, in our health services and communicate that then to our patients uh, that actually um, you should never do more than is necessary to respond to the condition uh, that you see in front of you. And that's why, in the way that Adrian said uh, at the beginning, it has always seemed to me that primary care has to be in the driving seat of a genuinely prudent healthcare uh, system because that's where we are most likely to be able to make uh, the difference that that minimum necessary intervention uh, principle uh, will be able to take hold. Um, how do we sustain a primary care uh, service into uh, the future? Well, here is a third prudent healthcare uh, principle and one where the future of research into primary care and into um, emergency uh, care, I think will be fundamental in helping us to use one of the levers which is closest to our own grasp and therefore most able to allow us to make a difference. Because I believe that the future of not just primary care but other healthcare services as well, they will not look like they do uh, today if they are to be sustainable in a prudent sense simply because uh, a belief that the way to sustain our primary care services in the pressure that they are under is to recruit more and more GPs, uh, I think is the pursuit of a chimera, because those people simply do not exist uh, in the number 
and with an idea of the contribution they want to make that will allow primary care to survive in future in the way that it has in the past. Instead, a prudent primary uh, care approach will revolve around liberating the contributions which a much wider range of clinicians are able to make to providing primary care services. And in the sense that, uh, in that old cliche, uh, mother necessity genuinely is the mother of uh, invention, uh, then we see in parts of Wales, particularly the further west you go, solutions to the provision of primary care in which a primary care service depends on a leadership provided by a smaller number of GPs who are prepared to work in those areas, providing clinical leadership, providing uh, oversight, but with their time freed up to do the things that only GPs can do by providing a service to a much wider range of patients through advanced practitioner uh, nurses, clinical pharmacists who work in the practice, um, physiotherapists who work in primary uh, care, and paramedics, advanced paramedics, who are providing a very, very uh, significant contribution to primary care in some parts uh, of South West Wales. The principle, the primary principle for prudent healthcare here, my third one, is the only do what only you can do principle. Uh, the notion that no clinician should routinely be spending their time providing care of a nature that does not require their level of skill or expertise. Now, how do we design the workforce of the future against that principle? Uh, and I think in the way that that treat example that I uh, provided earlier in ambulance uh, services, there is some really important research uh, to be done that looks at the way in which we can redesign, recreate new roles uh, in our health service to make sure that the skills and abilities of those scarcest people uh, in our system are really put to work doing the things that only they can do. And in order to do that, there will be some difficult uh, conversations about professional uh, boundaries, um, about things that were done in the past in a way that cannot be done uh, in the future. But when we get it right, uh, I think we will have a really important uh, piece of action that lies within our own gift in the way that so few things turn out uh, to do. That will make a real difference. And research and proper evidence-informed decisions around those uh, areas, I think, uh, will be essential in helping us to find a way forward. Uh, my final uh, principle uh, then uh, for this morning is maybe the most fundamental one of all, uh, and that is that if we are to succeed in doing uh, all of this, that we have to be on a journey that brings both professionals and those people who use our services uh, together. And I caught just the very last uh, slide uh, which showed uh, how that was you know, part of a research project that's already uh, there and ready to start. How do we create prudent patients for the future? Because a prudent healthcare system requires <coughs> prudent patients just as much as it requires prudent uh, services. Now, part of that, I think, is about us finding ways of presenting information to the public that helps them in the conversations that they need to have with those people who are helping to provide their care. We need people who are informed, properly informed, about some of the choices that are there for them in treatment. And the good news is, the really good news is, if you look at the research uh, evidence, that when patients are provided with a range of options that might be relevant to their set of circumstances, they do not default automatically to the most intrusive and the most expensive forms of intervention. They are more likely than clinicians to default to 
conservative and preservative forms uh, of treatment. In other words, patients on the whole are instinctively prudent in the way that they approach uh, their interaction with health and social care services, provided we do what we need to do to allow them to articulate those preferences. And the co-production principle, the final principle that I'm outlining uh, this morning, is about rebalancing the power relationships in our system in a way that recognises the contribution which users of services bring to the table, provided we are prepared to allow them to make that contribution provided we are prepared to change the nature of the conversation we have with them in a way that recognises their expertise in their own lives and circumstances and their capacity to engage in a conversation in which our question to them is, tell us what matters to you and how we can work with you to achieve the goals that are most important for you in the circumstances that you understand and know best. That's not easy. We have to work hard to uh, help people to be in that position. As I say, I think the good news is, is that once we take that first step, we will find that our patient and our user population is more receptive to some of this than we might at one time have believed. So, um, as I say, in, I, in the way that I see uh, the work of the centre, its interface with prudent healthcare principles, I think it is a very fruitful interface uh, indeed. I think there is an enormous amount uh, that you will be uh, able to do, I hope, uh, to assist us in making some of these principles actually matter in the different way in which we want services to be developed uh, in the future, both in terms of direct professional uh, practice and in the way in which we will design our professional roles for the future, and most importantly uh, of all, in the way that we will reshape uh, the bargain that we have between those who provide services and those uh, who use them. So thank you uh, once again uh, for the opportunity to say something at the start, near the start uh, of uh, your day. Um, congratulations as ever to all of those uh, involved in the hard work that goes into organising uh, an event such as this and for setting up the Prime Centre uh, in Wales. I look forward very much uh, to hearing about the work you will be doing and about the impact we wanted to make here in Wales. Dear Van thank you very much indeed. Thank you.